Hello, and welcome to another episode of Coffee with Polio Experts. My name is Firuz Korji, and I'm here today with Dr. Ananda Bandiopadhyay, who's Deputy Director of Polio Technology Research and, Al and Analytics at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We'll be discussing a very interesting innovation, a new polio vaccine, novel oral polio vaccine type 2, or NOPV2 for short, and its use in tackling CVDPV2 outbreaks. If you would like to learn more about polioviruses and the eradication effort, please check out our other Co Coffee with Polio Experts videos and the GPEI website polioeradication.org. Ananda, thank you for joining us today. Before we start, and for the benefit of our audience, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and your role in polio eradication? Thanks, Feroz. So I grew up in, in Calcutta uh, and I got uh, trained in Calcutta. I did my medical graduation there. And right after my med medical school graduation, I joined World Health Organization's National Polio Surveillance Project as a surveillance medical officer. And as a surveillance medical officer, I worked in India while India was intensely endemic for polio. I worked in several states in India. So that was my, my shoe leather epidemiology bit uh, in coming into public health. And then I got trained in public health and global health. Uh, and I joined the Gates Foundation about 10 years ago. And all along my role within the Gates Foundation's polio team, I have been focusing on polio research. Uh, so currently, I am a deputy director of the of the technology research and analytics team within the polio team, and I also co-lead along with my colleague Simona from WHO uh, the NOPV working group of Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Interesting. And from what I understand, uh, NOPV2 is quite a breakthrough uh, innovation for the polio program. Can you tell us a little bit more about it and how it differs from the Sabin type 2 polio vaccine? Sure. It, it indeed is, is quite an innovation. In fact, it is the first or new oral polio vaccine uh, to be developed and, and introduced over the past uh, 50 years or so. Uh, it's 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 also an example of how GPEI continuously uh, innovate and adapt newer tools and introduce uh, newer tools for the program to achieve and sustain eradication. So NOPV2 is essentially a modification of the existing mm -hmm. Sabin oral polio vaccine. Uh, it, it has been modified uh, from a genetic perspective and certain areas of the vaccine virus genome uh, has been modified to ensure that the new vaccine is more genetically stable and less likely to revert into the neurovirulent strains. Uh, so that's the, the core difference with right. Sabin OPV2. Uh, you know, so essentially it's more genetically stable and has a lower risk of reverting into neurovirulence. Uh, but overall, otherwise, it's very much comparable to the Sabin OPV uh, in terms of its overall safety, its immunogenicity, uh, its excretion properties, and so on. Interesting. And so when did the program realize that CVDPV2s were a problem? Um, and when did work to uh, develop NOPV2 begin? Yeah, it's a great question. So. Overall, Feroz, we knew all along, uh, you know, the, the use cases and the limitations, so to say, of each of the vaccines that we have uh, in the eradication program. So oral polio vaccine, for example, uh, is an excellent tool to interrupt person-to-person -person transmission. Uh, it's, it's highly immunogenic. It's also safe. So it is it has been the main tool to eliminate poliovirus transmission from most part of the world. More than 99.9% .9 of the world now is polio free, thanks to the widespread uh, massive use of the oral polio vaccine. IPV or the inactivated poliovirus vaccine on the other hand is also an excellent vaccine. It's highly immunogenic, uh, but on the other hand, IPV 
does not quite interrupt person-to-person -person transmission, particularly in the settings of poor sanitation and hygiene, because IPV doesn't quite induce mucosal, intestinal mucosal immunity. So you can see that each of these vaccines, you know, uh, would have its own distinct advantages. Uh, but given the fact that IPV doesn't quite induce uh, intestinal mucosal immunogenicity, you absolutely need Sabin OPVs, uh, you know, to serve the purpose of eradication because the essence of eradication is to stop all forms of polioviruses, not only the paralytic disease. But with that in mind, in rare circumstances, particularly in settings of persistently poor population immunity, uh, OPV can essentially revert into forms that can circulate in the communities and then revert to neurovirulence. Again, very, very rare, but uh, it is a, a, a concern in certain settings. And knowing that the, the global program all along had, had this strategy that at some point, all use of OPVs will have to be stopped. And eventually it will only be IPV that will be used for a, for a time period after we have stopped the transmission of the viruses. So to your point, from an overall strategic perspective, uh, we always knew that uh, there will be a time when OPV use will have to be stopped, maybe you know one serotype after the other, uh, and then we'll move to all IPV. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the quest to, to essentially develop an OPV that doesn't quite have that small but uh, you know real risk of reversion into neurovirulence, that quest has all, all along been there. So essentially back in 2011, uh, at, at the Gates Foundation, the first conversations started uh, with a group of scientific experts to develop a more genetically stable oral polio vaccine Again, keeping in mind that strategic focus of, on, on one hand, continuously focusing on interruption of all forms of polioviruses, at the same time managing the risk mm -hmm. of evolving uh, CVDPVs or circulating vaccine-derived polioviruses. So in 2011, uh, the conversation started, the initial work started, uh, and a scientific consortium was essentially formed. Uh, and the primary partners uh, there were the NIBSC of UK, uh, the, the United States Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, or your USCDC, and also the University of California, San Francisco. These were the primary partners of the, of the scientific consortium funded uh, by the Gates Foundation. And then the work began to, to essentially, uh, you know, get into the preclinical development of a series of vaccine candidates that had the promise of being more genetically stable. And then eventually it, it went into clinical development with, with involvement of several other partners. And Feroz, this has truly been a, a global effort. So, you know, if you look at the different partners, uh, from a clinical development perspective, and it would include uh, partners such as FIDEC, an organization from South and Central America, and partners uh, there uh, to uh, University of Antwerp, based out of Belgium, to ICDDRB in Bangladesh, to PATH in the US. So you can see it's, you know, all these global uh, agencies came together to help develop the vaccine uh, after that initial work of the scientific consortium. And then there are many other partners as well. USCDC, for example, has been the primary lab partner for this work. Uh, and then Biopharma is the manufacturer uh, and supplier of the vaccine. So this is how essentially the partnership got together and starting that journey in 2011, uh, you know, by the time, uh, you know, the, 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 the vaccine went into phase one, it was 2017, 
uh, and 2019 onwards we went into the phase two studies uh, and then the regulatory approval was obtained in 2020. So that's the, the journey uh, of the vaccine development for NOPV. That's very interesting, Ananda. And, and speaking of the regulatory approval, as I understand, yeah. um, the vaccine is being used under WHO's emergency use listing. So yes. can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that's working, and, and especially at the country level as well? Oh, absolutely. So that's yet another unique aspect of, of the development project because, you know, once we had the, the, vac the right vaccine candidate selected based on preclinical data and clinical data, the big question was how to roll the vaccine mm -hmm. out uh, because we were operating under a public health emergency of international concern, which polio uh, is. Uh, and, you know, so there is uh, this need of getting the vaccine to that child who is at risk uh, of the paralytic outbreaks. So the pathway that was chosen was, as you said, the emergency use listing uh, authorization process of WHO. And in fact, NOPV2 was the first ever vaccine uh, to be authorized under this pathway. Previously, other uh, therapeutic tools uh, have been authorized uh, with uh, this kind of a regulatory mechanism uh, like, uh, you know, for Ebola. But in terms of vaccines, this was the first one and essentially in a way paved the way for COVID-19 vaccines uh, to be authorized uh, under this pathway. And again, polio being a public health emergency of international concern, uh, was one of the key factors for the vaccine to be considered. And then the, the, the nature of the data that, that were generated around the vaccine and the public health need of, of uh, using the vaccine all played into the fact that EUL uh, was, was the, the chosen pathway uh, to, to get the vaccine rolled out in the field. That's very interesting. Thank you so much for sharing uh, the experience so far. It sounds like a lot of work has gone into the development and deployment of the vaccine. Right. So we appreciate you taking us through that. Um, and to our viewers, uh, that's all we have time for today with Coffee with Polio Experts. But be sure to catch part two of this interview. We'll be speaking with Ananda further on the um, use and performance of NOPV2 to date. So thank you for watching. And until then, take care. Thank you.